So the first video segment looked at price ceilings, legal maximums on prices. Now let's go ahead and look at price floors. And a price floor is a legal minimum on the price. Thou shalt not charge less than this. Or more commonly, it's a minimum price on the amount that the buyer can pay. And again, we have this issue of, is this a binding constraint that is a meaningful limitation on people's actions? And <clears throat> for a market where the price floor is below the equilibrium price, so if we put a price floor on gasoline of $3 a gallon, and it's already selling for 4 well, that's not actually limiting anyone's freedom of action to do what they want. So, they're not going to be limited by that. On the other hand, if the price floor is above the equilibrium price, then it's going to cause us to actually do something differently. And in particular, what's going to happen here is it's going to change the quantity demanded because we've changed the price from $4 to $5. So quantity demanded is where that price floor hits the demand curve. So quantity demanded falls. Some people who were willing and able to pay the equilibrium price of four dollars are not willing and able to pay the equally to pay the price floor price of five dollars. And quantity supplied is going to be where that five dollar price hits the supply curve. So some sellers who could not sell profitably at the equilibrium price of four dollars get into the market. Notice that the sellers who come into the market, the ones who couldn't profitably sell at $4, are people who have seller costs above $4. So we're bringing into the market a bunch of relatively inefficient, high-cost producers. So, all else equal, of course, producers are going to benefit from higher prices. So producer surplus is higher when prices are higher. Consumers, on the other hand, are going to be hurt by this. It's just all around bad for the buyers because the prices are now higher. So price floors are a form of transferring economic welfare from the buyers to the sellers. And as with our earlier price ceiling example, we can draw a picture here. Before the price floor was established, consumer surplus was A plus B plus C, everything above the price and below the demand curve. Producer surplus was D plus E plus F, everything below the price and above the supply curve. Now that we have the price floor, the actual number of transactions is the lesser quantity demanded and quantity supplied. So the actual number of transactions is here. Consumer surplus is everything above that price and below the demand curve. So consumer surplus is region A. Producer surplus is everything below the price, above the supply curve, but only up to this quantity, because these transactions out here don't happen. And of course, because they don't happen, this economic welfare, these gains from trade, and triangles C and E, no longer happen. And this is our dead, dead weight loss triangle again. C and E are lost from, pro, from consumer surplus and producer surplus, respectively, and no one gains them. This is in contrast to B over here, which used to be part of consumer surplus and has been transferred into producer surplus now. So B is essentially the redistribution. C and E are the inefficiency caused by the redistribution. This slide lays out in nice readable text everything that I just said. So economists are generally pretty skeptical or even downright hostile to price controls. And this is pretty universal across the political spectrum. So I've often used textbooks from um, Paul Krugman or Baumol and Blinder, and just the same as Mankiw or Cohen and Tabarek, they have a long chapter devoted to 
price controls and how they're going to create shortages or surpluses, how they're going to create inefficiency. And it's pretty much the same across the board. And again, generally economists favor prices as a way to efficiently coordinate economic activity. Nearly every Econ 1 textbook has in its first chapter some big ideas or first principles or something like that. And Paul Krugman, who has a New York Times column and often criticizes President Obama um, from the left for not being aggressive enough, um, one of his foundational principles is essentially markets usually lead to efficient outcomes. Now, all that said, economists are not necessarily hostile to redistribution. In fact, most economists say that some level of concern for the distribution of economic welfare is legitimate and important. So why are they so hostile to price controls? And that essentially comes down to the idea of are price controls the best way to pursue a distributive agenda? And the answer here is basically no. In fact, they're almost always the worst way to pursue an agenda for redistribution. And one way of sort of thinking about this is, let's suppose we put a price limit on something like electricity. So electricity, we think, is an important basic good. And if people don't have high incomes, of course, they can't afford electricity. So in addition to the problems of something like shortages that a price control on electricity might create, or gasoline or food, we also have the issue of who actually consumes more gasoline or electricity, low-income households or high-income households. Well, if you go out and look at the data, high-income households consume more thing of things like electricity and gasoline. So when you go ahead and establish a price control and redistribute economic welfare from the sellers of those goods to the buyers, higher income households are actually getting more benefit from those policies than lower income households. So they're extremely poorly targeted. The redistributions are extremely poorly targeted. Or if we look at something like, well, let's go ahead and think about how do we make low income housing more affordable? If we establish a rent control, it becomes less profitable to supply housing. So people are gonna supply less housing. And in particular, they may be less likely to supply housing in the areas that need it most. Or a third example would be, if we go ahead and establish a minimum wage, we actually make it less profitable to hire low-skilled workers because it's now more expensive to do so. And it's not clear that that's a great way to go ahead and make low-skilled workers better off. And it's also not clear why we would want to penalize the people who are actually hiring low-skilled workers and instead of taxing someone else and going and giving the money um, somewhere. So generally, economists are hostile to price controls because they're just really an inefficient way to redistribute economic welfare. Something like a housing voucher or a rent subsidy is a much more targeted way of helping people find housing services. And of course, what you're actually doing there is you're making it more profitable to supply housing services to low-income people by making it easier for those low-income people to actually pay their rent. Or instead of a minimum wage, which makes it less profitable to hire low-skilled workers, you could consider something like a wage subsidy where suppose well, if you hire a worker for $2 an hour, we'll give you, as an employer, $2 for every hour they work. And then gradually, as their wage goes up, you might reduce the subsidy there. So in that case, you're actually making it more profitable to hire low-skilled workers, and employers will actually do more of that. The logical conclusion of all this is actually that we might just sort of say, you know what, instead of worrying sort of category by category about rent and food and wages and so on and so forth, we could just say, you know what, people need some level of income and we're just going to grant that to them. So that's what a negative income tax is. The income tax is negative 
we give you simply some money, and then as you earn more, we're going to gradually um, fade that out. So this was Milton Friedman's proposal, who was a sort of famous libertarian economist, because if you're going to redistribute income, this is probably the essentially the most efficient way to redistribute income, and the one that really interferes least in people's choices about how to run their lives. So that was one of the reasons why he favored it. On the next couple of slides, there are a couple of review questions which you'll be able to look at. So you'll be able to pause this. And then here, you can go ahead and pause this right now because I'm going to stop the video.